<clears throat> just to recap what we did on uh, Wednesday, uh, we talked about glucose. Uh, glucose is the basic monomer of the polymers that is uh, um, carbohydrates. So glucose plus glucose will get you maltose. Sometimes it's called dextrose. Uh, glucose plus glucose is a sucrose, a sucrose molecule. This bond here, this bond here, uh, where's the pen? Da, 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 da. Pen. Okay. This bond here is a 1,4 glycosidic bond. This one is a 1,2 glycosidic bond. So 1, Two glycosidic bond. Because it is the first carbon and the second carbon um, that's connecting here. So it's like the first and, and this one is a one four glycosidic bond. Um, there you go. That's written there. One four. Um, the next one that we have is, uh, is lactose. Lactose and galactose are going to form, uh, a, also a one four. Let me write it down here. Lactose is glucose. Plus galactose, glucose plus galactose, and <clears throat> these two are um, enantiomers, so it's um, mirror images of one another. So they also form a similar linkage, which is a 1 4 glycosidic bond. Um, so maltose. And lactose, uh, um, lactose both have one four glycosidic bond. Glucose and fructose form sucrose, which has a one two glycosidic bond. Fructose and glucose are um, isomers. Glucose forms a, a six member ring, which is this one, because it is its linear form has an aldehyde. And this one forms a five member ring. Same formula, C6H12O6. Same formula, but it forms a five member ring because this, in its linear form, has a ketone. So if you remember from the previous chapter, ketone is a double bond with oxygen that is non terminal. And, um, um, aldose is a double bond with oxygen, which is terminal. Okay, and you have polysaccharides. The word uh, the word poly just means many. So there are many sugars. To a uh, couple of things that we're going to learn about many sugars. There's storage uh, sugars is are called starch. They're all monomers of glucose with a one four glycosidic bond. Um, and in animals, they're called glycogen. I am not going to expect you to know amylopectin, um, amylo, uh, pectin and amylose. Um, however, the difference between glycogen and starch is that glycogen is heavily branched, uh, whereas starch isn't. Um, the next one we have is a structural protein, a uh, structural polysaccharide. Structural polysaccharides are, um, cellulose um cellulose it's where it's how these uh one four glycosidic bond bondage is um because of which they do not um they're not e digestible by us you need your gut bacteria to do it so you'll notice the one four glycosidic bond where it kind of if you think about the, the, the computer screen as being a 2D screen, the 1,4 glycosidic bond is coming towards you and in uh, starch. So it's very easily accessible to the enzyme to break it up. Whereas if you think about the, the, the cellulose, the 1,4 glycosidic bond is going behind the computer screen. So it's not accessible to the enzymes, causing it to be undigestible easily by, you, by us. Um, I'm not 
didn't expect you to know all of that. And so, um, cellulose is very easily digestible by um, um, animals that chew the cud, which is uh, herbivorous animals. They have the four-chambered uh, stomach, which allows them to break it down, combine it with cellulose amylase, and then move it back into the stomach. And then structural um, polypsaccharide is chitin. Chitin is a part of the exoskeleton. If you think about crustaceans, uh, um, other arthropods, um, the hard exterior that you see, which is different from the muscles and those guys, that's that's a different co chemical combination. Uh, these are more um, um, arthropods big cockroach looking insects kind of things um they have a hard exterior shell skeleton we have an internal skeleton or so we have like an endoskeletal system they have an external skeletal system um and that is made up of a sugar molecule called chitin chitin is also used today to make dissolvable um surgical uh, thread the next class of <clears throat> molecules we're going to talk about is lipids. Lipids are very large molecules and they form two basic categories within uh, the cell. Um, one is um, the lipids, a uh, group of lipids, uh, which are fats. And the next one is uh, steroids. One of the most important structurally um, important molecule that we are going to do a lot of in this chapter is in this chapter and well, upcoming chapters is phospholipids. Phospholipids are the ones that form the cell membrane. Um, they they form the semi-permeable membrane that allows for molecules to selectively pass in and out of the cell, um, allowing for nutrition to come in, allowing for waste products to go out. Um, all of this is done by the phospholipid bilayer. Phospho meaning there's a phosphate group attached to a lipid group by layer two of them. So this um, one of the unique things about uh, this category of um, um, macromolecules is that they are not polymers. So polymers, the definition of a polymer is that there are repeating subunits of monomers. In this case, this is just a macromolecule. It's a really large molecule uh, with varying shapes and sizes. There are some repeating patterns to it, but they're not repeating subunits. Um, they are hydrophobic, hence they're not because they're nonpolar. Um, Fats basically are all constructed the same way. There is a large, there is a three carbon glycerol molecule. So it's a three carbons, three carbon alcohol. Um, if you remember from the previous chapter, alcohol has OH attached to it. And then there is a fatty acid. So fatty acid is uh, carboxylic, oh, carboxylic group, which means that there is a C double bond OH. You're going to see, I'm, I'm just going to draw it this way. The skeletal system, this just means that at every point here, there is a carbon and it has hydrogens attached to it so this it's a large hydrocarbon and on one end you're going to see the last carbon is going to be uh, carboxylic is always going to be terminal because if you count the number of bonds around it that's one two three four so it cannot make any other bonds so it's always going to be terminal this is a carboxylic a fatty acid is a combination of a glycerol molecule and a of the carboxylic acid, a fatty acid. Um, the, it also does the same dehydration reaction. Remember, when we have polymers and we want to make monomers, you have to do a dehydration reaction. This is where the oxygen comes, a water molecule comes off, this and forms an ester linkage. This is a, a, esters are another 
type of a functional group where you're going to see this. And everything else is connected here. So they might have something else connected here. Oxygen can make two bonds. So once an oxygen is connected on that side, it can make another bond on this side. Um, this is an ester, ester linkage. Ester is different from carboxylic. Carboxylic is going to have this. Just make sure you know that because otherwise it's, you'll make a bunch of mistakes. So this is going to be that. Whereas an ester is going to be this. There is, this is an ester. Oops. This is going to be an ester. This, you can see this where it forms an ester linkage. Um, it's also called esterification. The, the process of dehydration can also be called esterification. Um, you're going to have three, the glycerol, again, just going back to this. Um, so on the test, if you would, let's say this was A and there was, and somewhere else, this was D, uh, there were two separate molecules, the way you would identify. And then if the question asked you, what molecules do you have to combine to form a, a fatty acid? And then the answer for that would be A, which is a glycerol, three of B using an um, dehydration process to form an ester linkage. Um, that would be the appropriate answer there. So you find that there's a dehydration and there's an ester linkage formed right there. Um, so if I want to break this up into its acids, into the fatty acid component and then uh, the glycerol component, I would just add water. If I added water to this and do a hydrolysis reaction or a condensation uh, a reaction, then I would, uh, a hydration reaction, I would then break the bond. Esterification is going to follow the same rules as uh, monomers to polymers even though they by themselves are not polymers. They have similar units. They have multiple units that look similar and have similar functionalities, but they're not monomers. If you add water, it breaks up the high, uh, bonds. They're also called triglycerols, or you've heard it. Um, if, if you've ever gotten a blood test, they talk about tri your triglycerides. Um, the linkage is called an ester linkage. So there are different types of uh, fatty acids. Um, and let me get us. Okay, this is this. That's a good um, image. There are different types of fatty acids. Uh, the first one is a saturated fatty acid. A saturated fatty acid is where every single hydrocarbon here has a single bond. So everything is going to be this. Um, there are no double bonds. There are no, um, going back to the previous chapter, there are no alkenes in there. There is not a single alkene. Everything is an alkane, and it is for this fatty acid chain that we're talking about. We're not indicating this, right? It's the fatty acid chains. They all have single bonds. Um, so that they, there's no cis or trans formation. Hence, it's called saturated. It is saturated with all the possible hydrogens it can have. An unsaturated fatty acid is that, where there is at least one double bond. So because it has a double bond, if you remember the geometrical isomers that we talked about, if I had a double bond right here, and then I have a functional group there, and a functional group, like if I had like, let's say, um, hydrogen and chlorine, that would be a cis bond because two of the, because a higher, um, CH there's the next more substance, yes. Um, because both the higher probably, um, now, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Priority molecule, um, um, 
molecules are on the same side. So this would be a cis and this would be a trans. Now you might wonder, oh, but you're drawing chlorine on one side and CH3. This is cis and trans. Um, but in the case of fatty acids, I don't, you don't have chlorine. That is true. But if I count how many carbons are here, that is one, that would be one priority group. And then if I count the number of carbons here, oops. If I count the number of carbons here, that would be a second priority group. What is happening? That would be a second priority group. second priority group because of that the because of the fact that it is forming these double bonds it kind of forms like a kink in the chain so it kind of bends at a particular place so one of the easiest ways to find out if something is a cis or a trans struct or oil you would do is if you actually leave something like butter is cons is uh, a, a cis uh, structure so it's a saturated um I'm um, sorry, um, um, let me back up. Um, something like butter is a saturated um, fatty acid. Um, so at room temperature, it actually becomes solid. Because there is no cis or trans structures there and they're all single bonded, they can pack onto each other and the molecules can come closer to close, closer and closer um, and they can become a solid. Whereas if there is a double bond and there's a kink in the middle, they cannot pack into each other. So if this one's kinked, if I put a second molecule right here, that kink that is being formed here kind of keeps it that bend in the chain that's there that keeps it from packing on to each other. So a very good example for this is if you try it at home, uh, if you take olive oil or you take um, olive oil is a mono unsaturated. That means it has one double bond. If you try to take olive oil and put it in your refrigerator, it almost looks like a slurry. Um, it doesn't completely um, become a solid, but it's, it's a kind of coagulated little bits and pieces kind of thing. Um, uh, but if you take something like sunflower oil and put it in your refrigerator, the sunflower oil is literally going to stay the liquid that it is because sunflower oil is polyunsaturated. So there are many double bonds not allowing for any packing to happen. Um, whereas butter, on the other hand, even at room temperature, it's going to be a solid. Um, you would actually have to heat it up and kind of move the molecules separate when you heat something, temperature is the average kinetic energy of a molecule. So when you heat something, you're increasing the movement of the molecules. And as you increase the movement of the molecules, they kind of separate from each other. They're, they're moving away from each other, so allowing you to make a liquid. Um, most of the uh, fats, anything that's a fat, whether it's Crisco, lard, um, butter, all of these are solid at room temperature. Most of your animal byproducts, animal uh, fats are going to be, um, on, uh, are going to be saturated. That means they have single bonds. Uh, whereas plant products are going to be unsaturated. Omega fatty acids, which are fish products, um, the, which are, um, fats that you get from fish are also unsaturated. Um, you have heard a lot about um, saturated and unsaturated fats and, you know, um, probably heard it in um, on television and health magazines and stuff like that. Uh, unsaturated saturated fats tend to contribute to cardiovascular disease, uh, especially arthrosclerosis. It, so if you think about your blood vessels, the blood vessels are like hollow tubes. 
when you have a lot of unsaturated fatty acids, they deposit in the bottom of that tube or the top of that tube and form plaques. So if you have a, a diet very rich in uh, saturated, I'm sorry, very rich in saturated fatty acids, these plaque deposits happen and then your blood vessel is just going to get narrowed. Um, think about it as, as any um, pipe that you have at home that's you know, allowing is transporting water from the tap to your plants or wherever. If there is deposits in the pipe, whether if you have hard water, which has a lot of calcium deposits, it kind of narrows the pipe, uh, narrows the pipe down. So the amount of water coming out on the other side is less. Um, that is what leads to hypertension because hypertension is the um, tension within the the stress that is put within the blood vessels. If you have something blocking it, your stress is more. Um, the process of, uh, I'm not mistaken, I think there are some states that are trying to ban uh, trans fats. Um, trans fats, the way you make trans fats is basically a process of taking a unsaturated fatty acid and then hydrogenating it um, so adding hydrogens to that double bond so if i had a double bond right here uh, there's a process of hydrogenation so this is a double bond there are only hydrogens on both sides i'm adding a hydrogen molecule to it in the presence of an acid um, or um, you can also use a, a catalyst like platinum um, where you do an adsorption not the platinum that we use, industrial grade. Um, so it breaks this bond and then goes ahead and adds. So in the reaction, you're going to break that bond and that hydrogen is going to add itself right there. And then now this then becomes a hydrogenation process. This was a saturated fat, unsaturated fat. You added hydrogen molecules to it and became a saturated fat. Hydrogenation, um, and they happen across trans bonds, hence trans fats. Um, hence, they're called uh, tram, uh, trans fatty acids. Um, it, that's how they make, um, I can't believe it's not butter and all that fun stuff. Body fats play a very, very vital role besides the fact that all your cell membrane is made up of a fat called phospholipid. Phospholipids. We have a whole chapter about phospholipids and their functionality. So I will go into much more detail when we do chapter seven, where it's, which is essentially about phospholipids. Um, the other thing that fats do a lot in your body uh, is insulation. Um, your vital organs are covered with a layer of um, the fatty tissue in it. Um, it not only acts as insulation, it also, one of the other things it also does is uh, shock absorption. So um, you know, you bump into things, you hit things, you, as life goes on, things happen to you. Um, the fatty tissue also acts not just as a insulator, it also and protects your organs, but it also acts as a shock absorber. Um, the tissues in the type of cells in which fat is stored is called adipose um, the, uh, cells. Um, so if you have you have a bunch of cells, they combine to form a tissue. So it's adipose cells will combine to form adipose tissue. I'm going to do this. So phospholipids have the same things. First, the first part they have is a glycerol molecule. So that is a three carbon glycerol, um, three carbon alcohol. And instead of in a regular fatty acid, you're going to have two um, fatty, uh, three fatty acid chains. However, in this case, in phospholipids, you have two fatty acid chains um, and the third one is where a phosphate group is attached so you have this is a phosphate group um, PO4 minus 3 and then so a phosphate group is attached ah, it doesn't look like a minus um, there's a 
phosphate group to which you can have other things attached um a choline group is attached an acetylcholine group is attached multiple different uh, these things can be a uh, variable so i'm just going to put call it as x depending on where it is you depending on functionality that kind of is variable this portion of it is going to be is vital for our um for our existence for our cells to exist um they have two so these form chain tails this portion of it the fatty acid portion of it is going to be the tail which is um hydrophobic whereas the head portion of it because it has so many oxygen molecules in there these are oxygen the red molecules are, uh, are oxygen so since they have so many oxygen molecules in there which is electronegative which has a partially negative charge hence they are hydrophilic so the and they form like a bilayer so maybe there's a picture on the other side so they do form what is called as a bilayer your cells would have a hydrophobic the hydrophobic tails would go in the middle and remember these tails are also unsaturated so they have a double bond so there is a kink in the middle um and oops so you're going to see that and the hydrophobic. So you have multiple of them. They're, they're like placed next to each other. So they're going to look like that. And then you just. This then forms the inner layer of your cell. So it's a phospholipid bilayer. This is the outside of the cell. This is the inside of the cell. Um, inside. And this is the outside of the cell. So what is interacting with the world outside and inside of the cell is the hydrophilic heads. And what is in the middle is going to be the hydrophobic tails. So it's almost like a packing material that goes around. And these tails, since there are kinks in them, they don't pack onto each other and become solid at 25 degrees Celsius. That's a good image of it. So this is what it's going to look like. This is the outside of the cell. This is the inside of the cell. And then you have the packing of the tails in the middle. Um, again, remember that these tails are unsaturated. Unsaturated. So they have at least one double bond. And the difference between phospholipids and regular lipids is that in the case of a phospholipids, instead of having three tails three fatty acid tails they have two fatty acid tails and a phosphate group so the hydrophilic portion of um the fat is slightly larger um than than in regular fats this is slightly larger than in regular fats because there's like a little more oxygen in, available there they also do the exact same thing the two tails are forming an ester bond with the alcohol um addition of water will kind of separate them um if and proper enzymes are present, will separate them. The, the esterification, the trans esterification that takes place is also because of a dehydration reaction. So the main framework for how all of these things are formed, every single macromolecule, um, be it a monomer, or be it a polymer or not, is exactly the same. Every time you want to make a larger molecule, you're removing water. Every time you want to break a larger molecule, you're adding water. So it's dehydration and a hydration process it's it's always the process is always going to stay the same what subunits you're using is constantly going to change in the case of carbohydrates you're using glucose as a subunit in the case of fats you're using a fatty acid which has an carboxylic group a fatty acid what makes a fatty acid a fatty acid is the addition of the carboxylic group, large hydrocarbon and a C double bond OOH group. On the other is attaching to a alcohol group, to a glycerol. OL stands for alcohol there. So that because it has an OL group, there's a glycerol, it's a three carbon glycerol group. The OH from the alcohol is combining with the OH in the carboxylic acid, two OHs, 
one O stays in the system and the H two O comes out. So now you have an ester bond. So just to recap the whole thing, I'm just gonna, so the O H from the alcohol is combining with on this on this side on the carboxylic O H. This comes off. What's left over is C double bond O and H. And then on this side, you have the alcohol. On this side, you have the hydrocarbon. This bond is called an ester. And it's an ester linkage. Um, state, whether you're talking about phospholipids, whether you're talking about other fatty acids, that system stays the same. The only difference in this case, in the case of phospholipids, is that there are two fatty acid chains in the case of regular fats that we're talking about, whether you're talking about uh, olive oil, sulfola oil, whatever other oil, um, or butter or anything else, it is three fatty acid chains. The next class of lipids that we have are steroids. Steroids are hydrophobic. Um, they are also are structurally very different from the, the fats that we were talking about. They usually contain uh, fused chains. They are four fused. So at e if you was at each of these junctions, there is a carbon. And if it is not specified, if you don't specify something like that or something like that, um, then basically what it has is hydrogen. So all of these, so if the, this is a carbon right here, there's a hydrogen right there, there's a hydrogen right there because nothing else is specified. If it's not specified, there's a hydrogen. Um, the steroids play a very, very, very vital role in your body because, um, they form signaling molecules. They allow to form lipid rafts. That's kind of, <laughs> slightly rigid structures between the phospholipids so it gives your um, cell membrane a structure um, they are also a, play a vital role in forming different types of hormones um, so they give you um, um, growth hormones there is uh, um, estrogen testosterone um, or the the uh, metabolic rate determining hormones uh, um, your androgens which are estrogen and testosterone are also called androgens um something that allows for um homeostasis so there's a whole class of hormones that are formed with um estrogen um, i mean sorry are formed with um steroids this part of a steroid is going to pretty much stay the same and what's going to change is these these portions of it. Um, what is attached to the four fused rings is going to stay the same. Essentially, there's going to be four fused rings and multiple attachments to it. That's going to make it into different types of, um, of hormones. Um, cholesterol is a very vital part of your uh, being. Um, your body produces some cholesterol. You also get it from outer, outside sources. But when that balance in your body is um, messed up because you're consuming a lot or your body is producing a lot, whatever it is, um, uh, you can land up having cardiovascular disease. Going back to that same thing of atherosclerosis, if there's too much of it, kind of being transported by your blood, then it is going to start forming plaques on your blood vessels. So then we finished two of them, protein, um, the uh, lipids, and as well as carbohydrates. We're coming into the third uh, class of macromolecules. This is a polymer. Proteins are polymers. The monomer of a protein is an amino acid. Amino acid. Um, basically, it the the name itself suggests what it is. There is an amine group, which is an NH group, um, and then there is an acid group, which is a carboxylic acid. Uh, proteins are one of the most diverse group of. Uh, amino acid um, uh, of macromolecules that are there in our body they are capable of based on their structure based on their um 
um, the length of it and how they um, uh, how big they are and the shape of it they actually can perform a lot of different functions they can form structural support um they can um they are a part of your cellular um the mecha defense mechanism all your antibodies your igs and all of those there's proteins involved there they can form storage proteins they do they also are able to give you the same amount of energy uh you know if you're on a keto diet you you eat a lot more proteins because when proteins are broken down they can also give you four calories uh, per gram of protein just like carbohydrates can um so, uh, this class of macromolecules proteins um are going to keep coming up through all the different chapters that we go through because proteins are the workhorses of your body they tend to do most of the work that needs to be done in the body are done by uh, proteins for example if you think about an enzyme that is involved in the ones that we talked about in the past the hydration and the dehydration reactions that need to take place um enzymes are a class of proteins so if i want to digest lactose um i would need an enzyme called lactase um you would need an enzyme called so ase stands for an enzyme ose stands for um a, a sugar so if i want even if i want to digest a carbohydrate i would need an enzyme called lactose to facilitate that so proteins are in more than pretty much every stage of uh um, of nutrition gathering, of defense, of structure, uh, transporting things from point A to point B when vesicles are formed. Um, so this is a class of pro this is a class of um, macromolecules that's going to repeat itself to a great extent. So please pay close attention to its structure um, because that's what is going to determine its functionality. Um, So there are different types of classes of protein functions that we have. The first one is enzymatic. That is what we talked about in terms of enzymes. Uh, um, they, whether it is lactose uh, and lactase or it is pepsin, uh, pepsinogen, and uh, all the different digestive enzymes, the enzymes that break down proteins are also um, 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 proteins. So if your stomach is where proteins are digested the peptide bonds are broken down by an enzyme called pepsin um our proteins are broken down by a class of enzymes called proteases um they also provide a lot of structural support collagen and estrogen fibers which are extracellular fibers so if you have a cell right there and then you have a cell right there um you have collagen and elastin fibers in the middle once the collagen and elastin fibers as you grow older and older they, they tend to lose uh, the shape and integrity and that's how you'll end up getting wrinkles um, they form a lot of storage protein over albumin which is one of the more um, uh, the ones that we recognize there are other things also over albumin is egg whites um, they contain a lot the, the the function of an egg white is essentially to contain nutrients required by that cell to function and to do uh, growth and development so uh, uh, over albumin is going to be very rich in all the nutrients required for the cell to go through its development um and it's functioning as a storage protein transport proteins one of the most recognizable one is hemoglobin the function of hemo hemoglobin is what gives your blood that red color so it's found in red blood cells it has um an iron in the middle that uh, allows it the iron is positively charged so it allows it to collect the, the to transport oxygen from point a to point b in your body it also collects carbon dioxide and like allows it to leave the system um the next one is hormonal proteins there are a ton of hormone proteins that your uh, body produces insulin is one of them the function of insulin is to inform your cells that there is glucose in the system to allow the cells to uptake that glucose it functions as a hormonal protein um 
They are found in almost every cell on the surface of the cell, sometimes on the inside of the cell, sometimes going right through as uh, channel proteins that allow things that, that allow things to go in and out. They are also allow you to be receptor proteins. When the body is flushed with some sort of a hormone, these receptor proteins lock lock onto the hormone and allow for amplification of the signal and allow for the cell to do the functions that it is supposed to do in response to the hormones that have been um, provided to it. Um, there are class of receptors um, they do your muscles have two very important types of proteins called as actin and myosin which we will be doing in detail when we talk about the cytoskeleton cyto meaning cell and the skeleton uh, meaning structural problem um, if every time you actually flex or extend your muscles it is those actin and myosin uh, proteins that are functioning and allowing your muscles to stretch and uh, flex and extend. Um, they are a huge part of your antibody system. Antibodies are every time your body detects something that is a foreign material, there is a way in which your body combats that and that combat uh, all the all the components involved in that combat are antibodies and those antibodies are uh, made up of proteins. One of the huge class of proteins that we're going to talk about are enzymes. Enzymes are biological catalysts. Cat for every, um, just to recap this, for every reaction to take place, there has to be collisions in the right order. So for a reaction to take place, it has to be a certain amount of energy needs to be produced. And this, this would be an exothermic reaction. These are the products and this is the uh, reactant this amount of energy is then released in the form of heat. So this would be an exothermic reaction. If it was an endothermic reaction, let me change the color. So it's, oops. Let me just do that. I don't know. Um, so if it was an endothermic reaction, the same reaction will go up there. Um, and the products will be here. So this amount of energy then needs to be provided to it. So this would be an endothermic reaction. Endo meaning inside, you need to provide it energy in the form of heat. And this would be an exothermic reaction. This amount of energy that you produce, which is Ea, Ea, energy of activation, is the amount of activation energy. This whole thing is the activation energy, right? This amount of energy is your activation energy. The job of a catalyst is to actually reduce the activation energy. So let me change the color of the pen again so it's not too blue. So if I add in an active, um, a catalyst to it, it's basically reducing the amount of activation energy. So activation energy has reduced by so much, right? Um, that is the fun. It does not participate in the reaction. It is not a part of the reaction. It is not changed in any way, shape, or form in the reaction. However, it facilitates the reaction. Um, enzymes in your body is one of the biggest workhorses we have. Um, enzymes are very, very specific to the reactant they are working with. Reactants that need um, uh, an enzyme are also called substrates. So this is a very good example. This is called the active site. Oops. This is the active site. This active site, this whole thing, sorry. This whole thing is the active site. This active site is, think of it as a lock and key mechanism. So the, the key has grooves in it that fits perfectly into the hole that's on the lock and then turns them and then you can turn it and turn the locking mechanism. If you try to put a different key into the lock, if the grooves don't fit, the, the grooves on the, on the lock does not fit the, 
um, the markings on the key, you just can't fit the lock and key correctly. And that's what this is. The enzyme has an active site. This is an active site. This whole groove here is the active site and this active site fits perfectly into um, the substrate and once it fits into the substrate it's kind of holding it in place allowing for the reactions to take place so if i want a reaction to take place i must have if i want water to hit the so let's say i have this molecule and i want to break it down so i'm adding h2 oops I'm adding H2O to it, right? Um, this molecule is spinning around itself and also moving. So is this molecule. This water has to hit this part correctly at the right time, at the right orientation, the right way to add the um, H on one side and the OH on the other side and then break it up. For that to happen, so you, you just, just it, 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 it's a process of double coincidence right so you, you, everything has to happen at the right time however if i can hold this molecule in in a in a locked position where this part is constantly being exposed then this water can just directly add itself here and it breaks it down into the glucose and this one is um uh, sucrose so it will break it down into glucose and fructose Again, O-S-E means that it is a sugar. A-S-E is an enzyme. Um, and by doing that, you are reducing the amount of energy required for the reaction to happen. That is why the E-A comes down. The activation energy comes down. Um, these things are very specific. Enzymes are very specific to their substrate. Um, substrate is just a reactant that needs... Um, an enzyme so all substrates are reactants some reactants are not substrates because they don't need an enzyme um, these enzymes are very fragile the active site is very fragile if something happens to the shape of the active site then the enzyme is completely useless because Again, it is like a lock and key. If 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 your key has, you know, you bump into something and those uh, little indentations, I mean, little projections are bent or the shape of it changes or something happens and it doesn't fit into the uh, the 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 key very uh, the lock very well. At the same time, if you drop your lock a bunch of times or something gets stuck in that in the hole, something gets bent, moved then the key cannot fit into it. So this is very specific. For example, the process of changing this or of something of damaging it is called denature. It unravels. Proteins are very fragile. Uh, when exposed to heat, that it is not within its comfort zone. Uh, when exposed to a pH change that is not within its comfort zone, it tends to denature. And once it denatures, renaturing happens sometimes and sometimes it doesn't. Most of the times it doesn't. So it is a very fragile system because of which your body stays in homeostasis. One of the reasons your body keeps itself in homeostasis is to make sure that these proteins do not denature. Um, I'm going to stop here and then we will do polypeptides um, in class on Monday.